Greetings, friends. And after today, perhaps a few more enemies. You know, I'm really not in the business of trying to make enemies, but, I mean, damn, I, when I see this kind of bullshit, I just, I just gotta talk about it. <laughs> However, I am going to be respecting privacy and not calling people out by name, so hopefully that mitigates any ire that I would otherwise have garnered. So, as you can tell by the title and the thumbnail, we're gonna be discussing the Cyborg Tinker a little bit more today because I've been seeing some negative press online that frankly I, I just don't agree with and I think some of it leaves the realm of opinion and enters the realm of verifiably false and stupid. So we're gonna be counterpointing it, debunking it, however you want to say it. I just can't let these kind of things go unaddressed because when these kind of stupid opinions run rampant and unchecked it's bad for the community as a whole it's not good for the conversation around the book or around literature in general and stupidity needs to be checked and challenged that's just how i feel and that's not to say that all the opinions and all the statements that i'm debunking or countering or whatever rebutting are moronic or whatever some of them are though especially the ones that are you know verifiably false so without further ado let's get into it this first one oh God, this first one it's i blurred out the person's name and profile picture just because this one does fall under the ones that's moronic it's utterly moronic you can mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't get darker than dismantling human beings for spare parts. It doesn't get darker than treating people like things in a selfish bid to get revenge. That is a complete absence of humanity. That is a complete absence of any kind of ethics or morality. It does not get darker than that. That kind of lack of humanity is what drove people such as Mao, Stalin, and Hitler it does not get darker than that. So when I see a comment that says, the plot wasn't dark enough to be adult fantasy. We, we have people being butchered for parts. Butchered for parts. What do you need to make this novel dark enough for you? Do we, do, do we have to have on-page pedophilia? Just the beating of children and the kicking of puppies? What exactly is dark enough to constitute adult in your mind? I'm very curious, and I'm almost sure that the answer would revolt me. And then this next one. Um, uh, uh, again, factually wrong and, and just bad opinions bad takes so we're we're gonna go through this and uh, uh so as you can see here i've highlighted some points in this very long opinion piece that was a youtube comment that uh are just profoundly moronic in my opinion and fly in the face of what was actually in the book and so we're gonna talk about a few of these First of all, right here at the top, insta-love is very present with the female love interest. Sir, I don't know if you've ever been in love, or in lust, or if you have any concept of what the distinction between those two things are, but there's a big difference between insta-lust and insta-love, and I feel like Meg went out of her way to make the distinction clear in this book Gwen feels insta lust for Rora she does not feel insta love and in fact there's multiple passages where Gwen says I don't want to fuck her yet because I'm trying to build a relationship with her that's not insta love that's insta lust all the all the internal dialogue about how she wants to bang how she's so hot blah blah, blah and the instant chemistry that's called physical 
attraction. It's a natural function of sexual appetite. It's not insta-love, it's insta-lust, and it is normal. Ugh. The next one down here that's in black, the only one that's in black, I highlighted that just because it's kind of humorous, and on the one hand, I agree with him on this point. It is a very awkward phrase. No one would kick him out of bed for farting. It definitely made me do a double take, and it was definitely like, what the fuck? But, believe it or not, I know for a fact that this happens in real life. How? Because it happened to me one time. So, <laughs> yes, an ex-girlfriend who shall not be named and hopefully never mentioned again because, uh, yeah, she did that to me one time. It was embarrassing and caused a fight. And it was, uh, Anyways, next, none of these characters have really strong personalities. I, I, I don't, I just don't understand that that opinion none of these characters have strong personalities do you know what a strong personality is do you know what inner strength willpower morals ethics principles do you know what these things look like when they manifest in a personality bastian kaber doesn't have a strong personality he's only survived horrible trauma survived abuse by multiple people in his life leads a circus and controls people who are downright outlaw by any kind of you know social standard that we would measure them by these people are criminals and many of them very unsavory personality types and bastian kaber leads them almost effortlessly and you're saying he doesn't have a strong personality okay and what about rora the acrobat she set out with a goal from when she was a young woman in performance school. Her parents sent her away to a boarding school, and right from when she started being taught acrobat acrobatics, up until where we see her and meet her in the book, she's had a single goal to perform for the Emperor, and she has pursued that goal doggedly. What do you call that other than a strong personality, a determined personality? She lopped off her own hand to achieve her goal. That is a strong will. Crazy, yes, but a strong will, a determined will. That is a strong personality. She does not break down in the face of adversity. She does not shy away from challenge, and she pursues her goals with fervent desire so saying rora isn't a strong personality is just it's a moronic opinion i'm sorry it's just bad next down here we have gwen is having these feelings without any real sort of connection it's been set up that gwen would bang anyone with a pretty face again there's evidence on the page that goes against this She's offered sex by one of her crew members. She didn't take it. She's offered sex by one of the more attractive, popular, prominent figures in the circus. She doesn't take it. Gwen is not just some super slut out there looking to bang anything that will have her. That's not a legitimate critique. And we know it because we see it on the page. Enjoying sex and having a healthy sex drive and liking men and women doesn't make you a slut and it doesn't mean you don't have the ability to form healthy romantic connections there's a difference between lust and love and you can lust after someone but not love them you can love someone and not lust after them and you can lust and love after someone simultaneously humans are complex and you're lumping them into simplified categories because apparently you lack the ability to understand the complexity of human emotion and romantic interest so you might want to work on that then down here at the bottom he says that it feels like Gwen is supposed to be super competent and good at everything 
and that that doesn't feel like consistent characterization because she's supposedly the best ship tinker in the system, but then she has trouble unjamming a finger on her first day of working, and then later on she builds a high-functioning cyborg hand. Sir, do you understand that humans learn? Do you understand that there's a big difference between your first day on the job and months down the line after many, many hours of on-the-job experience and self-education through the materials she pilfered from the cyborg mistress library. Do you understand that humans can learn? Because those two things did not happen back to back. She did not have trouble with the finger jam and then the next day build a hand. Day one, she had trouble unjamming that finger. Months down the line, she finished working on Rora's replacement cyborg hand. It's called character development. Also, I don't know if you've ever done anything with your hands of a mechanical nature, worked on a car, uh, built a dog house from scratch, you know, something that's a skilled trade with your hands. But uh, as someone who does that kind of thing, let me tell you, there's a big difference between working on a car or a ship or an airplane and working on a cybernetic limb. Being a good ship tinker does not qualify you for being a good cyborg tinker. And again, it says that in the book. So your critique is trash. And then down here at the bottom, this individual admits that at the time of writing this big long comment, they are only one-fifth of the way through the book, and they're mad that the competition that's advertised in the book's blurb and as part of the marketing for the book just started. You're mad that the competition didn't start until you were one-fifth through the book. The book is 405 pages. One-fifth is about the 80th page. Sir, if you can't wait 80 pages for the main event to start, maybe pick up a children's book. And I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. I'm, I'm dead serious. This is adult literature where we expect things to take a little bit longer to get rolling. It's okay if there's a few chapters of buildup. It's okay if there's a few chapters of world building. I'm not telling authors that it's okay to cram shit tons of exposition and telling not showing into the first couple chapters. Don't do that. But a certain amount of world building and character building and exposition in the initial chapters to establish the world setting characters and underlying plot are necessary. Otherwise, it's very hard to build a cohesive narrative. So... That is a garbage critique. I'm sorry, it doesn't hold up under any kind of scrutiny. If you're mad that one of the main events, one of the main plot points of the book doesn't occur until page 80 in a 405 page book, go read children's books, go read young adult, and when you've developed some patience and refined your tastes a little bit, maybe then come back to the adult shelf. Okay, thanks, bye. Next, we're moving on to some things that I pulled from some video reviews here on YouTube. Again, I'm not going to mention the owners of these video reviews by name. I'm not interested in calling people out and being mean to them directly. I just want to make it clear that their ideas suck. So if, if they want to come to my video and take ownership of their ideas and rebut me, that's fine. We can have a discussion, and if I'm actually addressing them, I will be more uh, respectful and polite because again I'm not in the habit of trying to make enemies I just find it hard to restrain my thoughts and opinions when I'm speaking in the uh, guise of anonymity because I'm very passionate about these things and god this shit irritates me <laughs> so moving right along one video reviewer had a problem with a line in the book and the line was nicely fucking done. And the video reviewer says no one talks like that. 
I do. I know a lot of people that talk like that. It's actually very common in the neighborhood I grew up in. And it's also pretty common in Australia, mate. You gotta watch out for them drop bears. They be falling from the fucking eucalyptus trees and dropping F-bombs like you wouldn't fucking believe. I have a best friend who loves Australia and she goes there as often as she can. And every time she comes back, she talks Australian for a little bit until she gets reacclimated to being in the States where she hates it. And I assure you, there's entire countries of people who would use the phrase nicely fucking done routinely. It's not that odd. <sighs> people do talk like that. Another thing I heard in a video review was that we don't get a need out of Gwen's character. The person said that we had a lot of wants from Gwen's character, but not a need. So you're asserting that survival isn't a need? Okay, I guess no one really needs to be alive. Look, the desire to survive is a character motivation as old as storytelling itself. This is just a garbage critique. This is a garbage opinion. Gwen has a very clear character arc. Her goal of survival and making it through one day to the next while maintaining who she is as a person and holding on to her self-image and sanity is a constant struggle. She has an internal monologue about it damn near every other page. It actually gets tiring sometimes how much of this struggle takes front and center. And to say that Gwen doesn't have a clear need, it's just not a good critique. I'm sorry, it's just not. It's not a good opinion. She has a very clear need to survive, and she feels a very strong need to save the other cyborgs in this circus besides herself once the plot really gets rolling. And it really frustrates me when I see opinions like this, because it's like, did you even read the book? And by the way, in this particular case, the person admits to putting the book down halfway through. So I guess the clear answer there is, no, you didn't. Maybe you should finish. And you'd know she definitely had a clear need that she only expressed ad nauseum. Another thing that struck me as being a fairly unfair criticism is that people are going after the writing style and the setting and kind of how the book feels. And what I think a lot of people aren't really understanding here is that Meg is kind of blazing a trail. She's kind of trying to invent a format as far as I'm concerned. Um, adult fairy tales are not exactly in vogue. Fairy tales for adults are not exactly a popular genre, and that's exactly what Meg is trying to do here. So it's not like she's treading, you know, well-established paths and has perfect formulas to follow here. She's blazing trails, and so there's gonna be some missteps. Is her writing style perfect? No. I know I gave the book a solid review, but that's because I don't nitpick writing style nearly as much as I do serious story errors. And her story is there. Her characters are there. Her plot is there. Her writing style is less important to me than if she actually communicated a good story, which she did. And so, I can't get overly mad about how she chooses to tell her story unless she does it so poorly that her story suffers because of it. And it didn't really. Continuing on with uh, that point, a lot of people have been complaining that some of Meg's sentences were awkward, that some of the prose in the novel didn't flow well, didn't make sense, uh, didn't al uh, allow the reader to read through seamlessly, you know, double takes and uh, just, just going, huh? And I'll admit, there are a few places where that happens. The kicking a man out of bed for a farting thing being one of them. But here's what you need to understand. 
sometimes that's a matter of voice and that's a slippery slope that's a dangerous excuse to get in the habit of using but here's why I think it applies if you read all the way through the book you and you analyze it you see that most of those awkward sentences belong to Gwen they happen when we're following Gwen's character so I really feel like the awkward sentences is part of Gwen's voice which if you analyze her behavior and her dialogue I think that follows with the character itself Gwen is not the most socially gifted person so this awkward slightly clunky way of articulating and expressing oneself that falls in line with her character in my opinion and saying that these awkward sentences uh, you know make the book unreadable or hard to understand or whatever to that I say up your reading comprehension game a little bit I mean I am not a college educated guy and I'm not even the brightest kid on the block but there isn't a single sentence in the book that tripped me up to the point where I had to double take it I mean come on it it's all plain English come on people another thing I've heard people bitch about plenty is the world building and that's a fairly legitimate gripe on the one hand and it's a garbage gripe on the other the thing about world building is it's hard and it's a delicate balance between establishing your world and giving the reader enough to go on and cramming exposition and telling down our throats Meg did a decent job of establishing her settings Meg did a decent job of establishing the social and political climate and everything was established enough to give us a framework so the story could be followed and that's all the world building you need I agree that Meg's world is very interesting and potentially going into some of the facets of her world could be more interesting than the love story she wanted to tell but she wanted to tell the love story that's her prerogative so while I would absolutely love to see the world building expanded in the sequel I don't think it's fair to say that she didn't do a sufficient job of world building because there was definitely enough world building to communicate the story clearly and that's all you really need going along with the last two comments we really need to talk about the fact that style does not equal quality Meg has a slightly awkward fairy tale kind of you know awkward schoolgirl style to her prose at least when the narrative is following Gwen and that style does not necessarily mean that there's a problem with quality especially because it's consistent and it falls away when we're following Rora and especially when we're following Bastion so I really feel like her style isn't the problem it's that you don't like her style and that's fine you're allowed to not like style that is a matter of personal preference but it's an unfair critique to say that her style equates to bad quality her syntax is fine her grammar is fine her sentence structure is fine it's all proper English just because you don't like the way she structures her sentences doesn't mean it's bad I say this is someone who has read a book where the syntax was garbage the grammar was garbage where sentences literally did not make sense you had to read a paragraph forward and then you go went back to the paragraph prior and you analyze this block of text three or four times to figure out what this one sentence meant I've read books like that that doesn't happen in the cyborg tinker some of the sentences are a little clunky but they all make sense so there's not a quality problem it's a style grievance and the fact that you can't articulate the difference says to me you're not fit to offer a criticism on her writing sorry this is the big boy table we're analyzing literature 
not discussing which flavor of popsicle we like best. Man, I'm kind of coming off as an asshole, aren't I? Eh. Here's one that offended my sensibilities in a few different ways, and I really do not care for the way some people are talking about Gwen and her sexuality. I already alluded to this pre previous, but this deserves its own point. Because the simple fact is, is that Gwen is not a slut. She is not some character who's a walking sexual stereotype. She is not, you know, the, the, she's not a fantasy. She's not the bisexual trope. People are throwing that phrase around like, like a review confetti. She's not those things. This is a character who likes sex and there's nothing wrong with liking sex, who has a brain tumor, and they know for a fact it's gonna kill them. You're gonna begrudge a character for wanting to get laid in their last few months? What kind of a Puritan prick are you? You're gonna begrudge someone for wanting to get laid when they're on their way out the door. You're a dick, and you're selfish, and stuck up, and a bunch of other unkind things I could say. Seriously, if you're dying and you're looking for a little bit of escape, consensual sex with another adult is way okay by me. It's not a fair critique to call Gwen a slut because she wants to get laid. And I know what people are going to say. They're going to they're going to be like, "But she banged a stranger in an alleyway and boo -boo -boo. again, She's dying. You don't exactly care about long-term consequences of your behavior and give much damn about the public perception of your actions when you're going to be dead in six months. It's a bad critique. It's lazy. You're critiquing someone's lawful and harmless behavior. Seriously, it's, it's, uh, I, I just cannot describe how much it bugs me. Another critique that kind of falls flat, in my opinion, but in the defense of the people launching it, Meg did set herself up for this one a little bit. The TCT is bad sci-fi crowd. Look, if you read the book, it's pretty obvious that Meg never intended this to be serious sci-fi. This is a fairy tale, an adult fairy tale. A steampunk adult fairy tale and it's fantastical and whimsical and it makes sense and it's coherent but it doesn't hold up under scientific scrutiny because it's not supposed to so while I understand that Meg invited this critique upon herself because she marketed the book as being science fiction -y, I feel she deserves a pass on this because once you actually get into the meat of the writing, it's clear it's not serious science fiction. It's science fantasy at best. And you know, when you you, you gotta you gotta meet the writer where they're at. You can't place a bunch of expectations upon a writer and expect them to meet them. And again, I get that Meg kind of invited those expectations because she did market it as science fiction to a certain degree. So to a certain degree, that one's on her. So that one's a toss up. Another thing I've seen get critiqued and lampooned, etc., etc., was the relationship dynamic between Gwen and the relationship dynamic between Rora. People accuse Gwen and Rora of having insta-love. People accuse Gwen and Bastion of having no chemistry. Mind you, these are the same people who are one-fifth or one-half their way through the book. Oh, look. It's not my place or yours to critique someone else's relationship. As long as there's no abuse taking place, stay the hell out of other people's relationships. You have no business there. And to say that Gwen and Bastion have no chemistry is to ignore the very real fact that the chemistry developed slowly over the course of the book. She didn't like him at first, but he grew on her because he's a strong principled man who sticks to his guns. 
and women find that attractive more often than not. So saying they have no chemistry is lazy, and you're probably saying that because you didn't finish the book. As for the Rora and Gwen have insta-love thing, first of all, they didn't. Gwen felt insta-lust for Rora. Second of all, insta-love is a thing. I might catch some flack for saying this, but it does happen in real life, and sometimes it even works out. Love, in first, love at first sight is a trope because it does happen. I'm not saying it's ideal, and I'm not saying that it's the healthiest way to start a relationship, but it does happen. You can fall in love with someone at first sight. And I say that because I believe love is a choice. You choose to love someone. So yes, you can gaze upon someone and say, I'm going to love that person with everything I have until the day I die. You might be a lovesick fool and a little bit crazy, but you can do it. No one can stop you. Now I have two more points to make, and one of them kind of as an umbrella over every other point so far, and one of them is about the greater cultural conversation here on Book and Author Tube in general. So first, if you DNF a book, do not finish. You don't really have any business writing a serious review, in my opinion, especially a negative one. Most of the negative press I've seen this book receive came from people who did not finish. And most of their criticisms fall apart under the context of a finished story. If you don't finish the book, keep your shitty opinions to yourself. I'm sorry, that's how I feel. And I say that both as a reader and a writer. If you don't even have the gumption to finish the story and analyze it in its entirety, you don't have any kind of legitimate criticisms to offer unless there's such a blatant, glaring issue that it cannot be resolved through further writing, such as blatantly racist depictions of characters, such as massive plot holes, such as other types of in-your-face, unsolvable issues. But the, the Cyborg Tinker doesn't have anything like that. All the issues that I've seen people bring up get resolved if you finish the book and analyze it in its entirety. Yes, there are some awkward sentences. Yes, Meg's writing style does leave a little bit to be desired sometimes. Yes, some of the dialogue is clunky. And then, my last point isn't so much about the book, but about a greater conversation taking place around the book. And that's, are author tubers shills? Are they legitimate authors, or are they just using YouTube as a platform to build an audience to market their shitty books to? Now, obviously, I'm a little bit biased here because I'm planning to release my own novel, hopefully early next year. However, I'm also a reader, and I'm also part of this community, and so are Meg and Jenna. And let me tell you, they're adding value to this community. They're not just here to get an audience to sell their book to. They're adding value to the community. They have beloved content that is funny, and insightful and informative and whether you're there for writing advice or to hear jenna's awesome rants or just to get some perspective on certain aspects of writing they are contributing value to this community and so even if you don't like the book it's not fair to say that they're just here to sell you their book and it's not fair to say that all author two books are bad because just because you don't like a few of their books doesn't mean that every author tuber's writing is bad <sighs> and of course that does come from a slightly biased position so i will admit you have to take that one with a grain of salt so be it and finally guys i'm gonna wrap this up once again by saying i'm really not trying to pick a fight here that's why i'm not calling anyone out by name that's why I blurred screen names and pictures. 
I used harsh language because I get passionate about these things. I have very strong opinions about these things. But damn it, if you can't even finish the book, if you can't even apply college level reading comprehension to properly analyze the writing on the page, what am I supposed to do when your opinion isn't even an opinion because it's factually incorrect? What the hell am I to do? I refuse to be the guy that just sees this stuff and doesn't say anything about it because all the worst problems in the world exist because people let them go when they were a small problem. So, <clears throat> all right, guys, book review is coming out soon. Ready Player Two, A Sky Beyond the Storm. Um, as well as The Art of War by Sun Tzu and some other Chinese philosophy books that I picked up because I want to do me some learning. I'd also like to do some trope discussion videos here sometime soon because, you know, some lighthearted, more freeform content where I'm not being a dick to strangers on the internet would probably be nice. <laughs> Alright guys, until next time, be well. Happy Holidays, Merry Christmas.